Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George Ortega, and today we're going to be talking, the topic is going to be free will refuted by the pleasure principle. Okay, and this is episode number 128. <laughs> Can you believe we've done 128 of these over two years? Um, and we're taping this on June 18th, 2013. Okay, and we're going to keep doing this. I'm going to do that. I fired my co-host. He's like my best friend and stuff, but like, you know, he couldn't make it to the tapings. You know, this is a professional show here, kind of. So we, you know. Anyway, so we're still doing, like, I'll do a commercial before we get into this. We're still doing our live call-in show in Manhattan that he produces on, on MNN, Manhattan's, you know, network. You know, goes to like over... Um, you know, what, uh, over a million people, or uh, half a million people at least. But anyway, that's every Wednesday at 11 p.m., okay? So um, so you can catch us there. But anyway, so yeah, we're going to, I'm going to do this until, until you get it, until you, the world changes, because this is insane. All right. And all right, ordinarily in the shows, you know, before I get into the main theme, I'll go, I'll go through the definition of what we mean by free will, refute it briefly, you know, with causality and, you know, demonstrate why it's important. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to try to do this quickly because I don't want to spend more, you know, because like, because I have a feeling that like, you know, people get the reason, but they want to, they want to understand it in, in ways other than causality. That's causality is the basic reason why free will is impossible. But all right. So, so what do we mean when we say we have free will? If we had a free will, whatever we said, you know, this that I'm saying right now, what you're hearing, <coughs> you're hearing right now, or the thoughts you come into your head, everything that we would be doing, thinking, feeling, everything would, would be up to us. In other words, nothing that wasn't in our control would be making us do this. Okay, well, what is not in our control? Well, causality, this principle of causality, the whole fabric of the universe, <laughs> the, 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 the basic me mechanism in the universe, why everything happens, what's causality? Causality is um, one thing that everything has a cause, okay? Everything has to have a cause. So if, like, if all our decisions have causes, then there's causes to those causes and causes to those causes. You have the causal antecedents regressing back to before we were born. Obviously, that makes free will impossible. Okay, why is this important, or how important is this? There is a uh, philosopher who's like, 2010, he was listed the 13th most cited of all the philosophers in the world who were born after 1900, okay? And his name is John Searle, an American philosopher, and he was asked to comment on the prospect of free will being shown to be an illusion by Susan Blackmore in her 2005 book, Conversations on Consciousness. And what he said, and I, I'm pretty directly quoting, I gotta get, you know, I'll, I'll bring a direct quote. He said like, that would be a bigger, bigger revolution in our thinking than Einstein or Copernicus or Newton or Galileo or Darwin. It would alter our whole conception of our relation with the universe. That's how big this is. I mean like, this is an evolutionary shift in human consciousness. You know, right now the entire world believes that what we do, think, feel, that our lives are up to us, when in fact it's all a movie. It's all, you know, and it has to be the, that way. There's absolutely no way that it could ever be different, you know. And it, it's a bit unfortunate because, like, in a certain sense, and actually this is conditioned also, in, in a certain sense, if we had a free will, part of that, that's what we'll be getting into part of today, who among us would be like anything but completely happy or completely good, okay? So like it would be great if we had a free will, and who knows, maybe we will evolve into beings that are ultimately completely happy, completely good. You know, that, that seems to make sense. That You know, it may take however long it takes. But, but um, you know, clearly we don't have a free will because if we did have a free will, we could choose positive thoughts all the time. We could choose to be moral. We wouldn't like succumb to like these these uh, immoral temptations and stuff that, that just like, you know, we succumb to anyway. All right, so, um, so yeah, so, the, you know, like, the reason this show is important because, like, you know, the belief in free will causes a lot of harm. It causes us to blame each other, to blame ourselves, to hate other people. It causes us to not feel, you know, good about our sometimes. It causes envy sometimes. It, it causes arrogance when sometimes when we do really good, We'll, we'll think we're better than others and we won't treat others as well and all. So it causes 
divisiveness. It causes separation between people. It's not a good illusion. It's not, you know, and again, I would be the last person to blame us because we don't have a free will. It's not our fault that we have it, but to the extent we can overcome it, we can create a much, 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 much better world. Okay. So, all right. Basically, like, I'm, I'm going to go through this again very fast. The reason we don't have free will is causality. Everything has a cause. All our thoughts have a cause. You know, some people say, well, not everything has a cause. Fine. If our thoughts and feelings and actions didn't have a cause, they couldn't be attributed to our free will. In other words, we, couldn't, we can't cause what doesn't have a cause. All right? So that's not going to be free will. Some people say that, well, some things are the cause of themselves. Fine. If what we do is causing itself, we're not causing it. Our human will isn't causing it. Again, that, that's no fruit. Some people say that, well, our thoughts are spiritual. You know, this causality is a physical construct, is a physical concept. It only applies to the physical world. Wrong. Causality is a physical concept, but it's also a, it's conceptual. It applies to everything. Number two, if you're having a decision and you define it as spiritual, that decision is nonetheless taking place within a moment in time. Once it occupies a precise moment in time, it's part of that timeline that's part of space-time, that's part of the physical fabric of the universe. So you can't, you can't call a, a, a thought spiritual and, and think that that will somehow you know, circumvent the laws of physics, because it, it can't. And again, you know, like, causality is not just a physical construct. It's a logical, rational construct that applies to everything. Nothing can happen without a cause. All right. Now, so like we've got like 20 minutes, good. We're getting, we're going to get into why you know this pleasure principle makes free will impossible. Because again, you know, causality is the basic reason. But sometimes, you know, the more kinds of ways that you understand why free will is impossible, the better you'll get it. You know, the more sense it'll make to you. Okay, so the um, so essentially, we're hardwired. We're not the only ones with this that, that have this um, other other animals you know organisms have have this we're hardwired to seek pleasure and avoid pain okay that's what we do you know we we we, we you know we move away from pain toward pleasure you know you can see this in smaller organisms you can see this that it's part of the the animal kingdom part of even plants do this you know plants a plant will move toward the light or you know move toward where there's more water, you know, <coughs> excuse me, I should drink some water. All right, so we share this with all organisms, and this is hardwired. This isn't anything that we have a choice in. That's what we're made to do. Okay, so the pleasure principle. Okay, the, many of us are familiar with this relative to Sigmund Freud with his pleasure principle, but you got to remember, his was only one of various several um, conceptualizations of the basic idea. In other words, his pleasure principle dealt with the id, the ego, you know, the super ego constructs that may or may not actually be genuine. You know, they're theoretical. They're not concepts that actually, you know, have been proven. But, but you know, Freud's conception of the present pleasure principle was the most popular, but basically what I'm try trying to say that there are other formulations other than Freud's that, that express the same um, concept. Okay, sometimes one of the objections that come to mind with people sometimes when they hear this is like, well, no, we're not always driven by what's going to um, be the most pleasant. Sometimes we'll choose, and we can choose, to, to endure something that is going to be unpleasant, like somebody who like runs marathons, 26 miles of grueling, painful stuff, you know, clearly that's not in keeping with this pleasure principle, but it is, you know, why? Because like what happens is like when a person chooses to undergo that, see a lot of times the pleasure principle doesn't relate just to the present, it also relates to the future, it's a prediction of what's going to grant us the most amount of overall pleasure, you know, within this equation of, of, of pleasure and pain. So in other words, like the marathon runners say to themselves, well, you know, like if I run this marathon, I'm going to feel better after having run it. And that, that pleasure is going to last longer than if I didn't run it. Okay? 
sometimes people say, well, you know, um, we've got a survival instinct that, that's really, really strong. But, or, or that, that like sometimes we'll do things that will sacrifice our lives, our, our, our well-being, our health, you know, in ways that seem to contradict this pleasure principle. But again, when you think about it in more detail, let's say you have a soldier that volunteers for um, a very difficult, you know, mission wherein he's going to like, you know, be in either great danger or just like may just not come back alive, you know, just like like the kamikaze pilots in World War II, Japan's pilots. Okay, in cases like that, what happens is like we have a conscience. So like in cases like that, the person is thinking to themselves, well, they're going to feel better about themselves if they decide to undergo this great risk to their very being than if they decided not to. You know, and part of this may be predicated on a belief in the afterlife, you know, that like, you know, if you die a hero, then you'll go to heaven and you'll be rewarded in the next life, okay? But a lot of it has to do with this life, just that like, you know, if something needs to be done that, that, that requires valor, you know, courage, and, you know, and, and you're called upon to do it, you know, to not do it would be an affront on your conscience. In other words, it'd be difficult to live with yourself more so than if, if you volunteer for something like that, okay? So, um, so you know, and, and again, like also like with parents, parents will endure a lot of pain raising their kids. You know, kids raising kids isn't also isn't, isn't always all that pleasant, but you know, it's kind of like their prediction is that they they undergo this pain. It's a delayed gratification, f so that in the future, both through their children and through themselves, then it's going to create greater over, overall pleasure, okay? So, so basically, you know, these, these objections to the pr pleasure principle don't really pan out when, when you think about them, when you, when you investigate them. Okay, so, so all we do, that's all we do. We seek pleasure and avoid pain. That's what we do. And like, if that's all we're doing, if that's all we can ever do, and that's not, this is hardwired, it's not up to us, then any decision we make you know, whether I'm going to eat an apple or an orange for dessert, whether I'm going to see this movie or that, whether I'm going to do this or that, it's all based on this pleasure principle. You know, what I predict, not what it's going to absolutely, because we make mistakes with this. You know, a lot of times we predict that something's going to be more pleasurable. It isn't, but it's all about the prediction. We, we, we believe or predict that our behavior is going to result in more pleasure. So, like, um, an analogy to this that, that may be useful, let's say you create a robot with wheels, okay? and you program this robot that every time it gets to a wall it's going to make a left turn okay it's not going to like you know it would it would um ostensibly have a choice of of going left or right you would think you know but it's programmed to always make a left turn now when that robot gets to the wall does it have a choice whether to go left or right no because it's programmed to always go left okay so it's the same with us when we have a decision you know, before us, when we do anything we do, because we're hardwired to always seek pleasure and avoid pain, we're always going to do what we believe is going to create the greatest pleasure for us. Um, a lot of times, this this hasn't just this isn't just to do with us. All right, I want to like uh, it's not a part of my notes, but I want to go through this. Um, this idea of well. All right, just briefly, okay. John Locke, a, a British philosopher, famous British philosopher, defined um, goodness as what creates happiness, okay? And then another philosopher, utilitarian philosopher, Jeremy Bentham, said that the, the, the measure of goodness is what creates the greatest happiness for the greatest number. In other words, like this, this goes back to the conscience thing. Sometimes, you know, we will sacrifice you know, our lives, a substantial portion or, or period in our lives to benefit the greater good. But again, it's, it's, we're, we can't say that we're doing that opposed to our pleasure principle because we're doing that to satisfy our conscience. You know, that would be something we'd be doing because it, would, it feels better for us to, to make that sacrifice so that on a whole everyone w would be happier. Okay. Um, and like, okay, 
very similar to um to this pleasure principle is kind of like we also have like a, a moral imperative we you know the greeks understood this we're basically also hardwired to at the time we're doing whatever we're doing believe we're doing the right thing and this could be like let's say we're, we're stealing money from a company okay you know some people might um do that they in their minds would would say well you know this company's stealing from employees so like it's kind of like a robin hood thing i'm getting them back or the guy who just like the guy who just um who revealed that the um the um the federal security agency whatever that that spy agency was spying was was like recording all of our telephone calls and, and emails and stuff and that the, the our politicians were lying to us about it that they you know they'd go in, out in front of the public and say no we're not doing that this guy just exposed them this guy just said yes that not only are they doing that they're also spying on the chinese when like you know months ago you'd see articles on how like we were complaining that the chinese were spying on us so anyway, so this guy Snowden um, decided to be a whistleblower. You know, in his mind, even though some people may think he was doing something wrong, I personally believe he was doing something very right because, you know, our politicians were lying to us. They were lying to the entire world. When they do that, that places us in danger, at risk from other countries. And, you know, it's just not good. So, like, you know, so morality doesn't always have to do with, like, what other people might believe is right, whatever. But, um, all right. So anyway, um, so we have this moral imperative also to always do what we think is right. And that's actually kind of like a, um, it's an aspect of the, of the pleasure principle. Because in other words, like it gives us pleasure, you know, to do what we believe is right. You know, morality is, is, a, is, a, is a hedonic consideration, you know. All right. So, so again, like just because... Um, we are hardwired to seek pleasure, avoid pain, doesn't mean we're always going to make wise decisions. Um, before doing this show, I did um, about 100, almost 140 episodes on happiness, according to the research, according to the science. It was called The Happiness Show. And one of the things I would talk about back then was that, like, basically, even though happiness, you know, when you, when you ask people what their basic motivation in life is, Survey after survey, year after year, they always say happiness. Happiness is the main point of life. People get this when you ask them, okay? But, you know, in terms of, like, predicting what's going to lead to the greatest happiness, you know, in the future, unfortunately, you know, can't blame us because we don't have free will, but we're not all that good at predicting that. Well, a lot of times we'll predict that it's about more money, more success, more education, more material goods, and, and, and most of these things, these things that I just mentioned, like money above the poverty line, the more you have, the less impact it's going to have on your happiness. You could get advanced degrees. You're not going to be any more happier with a PhD or with three PhDs than with a bachelor's, okay? So level of education is gonna make it, isn't going to make a difference. The more things you have isn't going to make a difference, generally. So what I'm trying to say is like, you know, so like, even though we're hardwired to always seek pleasure and avoid pain, doesn't mean that we're very good at predicting what's, what's going to make us happiest. Okay. So, all right. So, so think about it. You know, let's, let's pull this very directly to our human free will. You know, if we've got this basic motivation in life that we're always going to be seeking pleasure, always going to be avoiding pain, Every decision we make is going to base, be based on that. If we're deciding between two movies and we predict that seeing one of them is going to result in a more enjoyable experience than seeing another or, or have some other kind of value, because it may not be as enjoyable, but it might be something that would fulfill our, you know, the needs of our conscience, you know, if we're driven by that, that's not a free will. We have to make that decision. We can't go against that. You know, so that's a very good, and think about it, again, I started the show in this way, but, but this is a very, very powerful salient point. If we had a free will, if you had a free will, you would be thinking positive, pleasant, very happy thoughts every moment of every day, okay? That's the reality. You would, I would, we all would. If we had a free will, who among us would choose to feel negative, unpleasant thoughts at all okay and so like what's the fact about this um according to the research according to the happiness research generally this applies to to the, even the happiest people among us 
we spend only about 50% of our days being happy, okay? The other 30%, 30% of our day is, is actually felt feeling unhappy emotions, you know, feelings and stuff. And then about 20% we're neither feeling happy nor unhappy. We might be distracted so much we're not even thinking about it or whatever. But that's the equation. That's, that's, that's how it breaks down statistically. So like if we're only like happy 50% of the time, think about it. If we had a free will, we'd be choosing to feel happy feelings all of the time. I mean, that should tell you. And again, like tying this with the morality too. If we had a free will, who among us would freely choose to do stuff that we consider was wrong? I mean, the Greeks understood we can't do this. But like, you know, if we had a free will, we would, um, we would always do what was right. You know, we would never harm the people we love in our lives. We would never harm ourselves. We would just do what was right because we, we value um, morality. We value goodness. Okay. Um, some people will assert that, all right, well, this pleasure principle might, um, might account for some of why we decide what we decide, but there may be other factors. Like, they maybe don't understand that, like, sacrifice, you know, um, placing ourselves at risk for the, the good of the country or for the good of people we love is actually an exercise in in um, satisfying the dictates of our conscience. All right, they, you know, some people don't understand that, but so they say that, like, you know, the pleasure principle is perhaps one of several kinds of motivators, like survival instinct, um, that guide our behaviors. And they say that, like, because of that, perhaps a free will could exist. But all right, the, and I've done shows about this. The point here is that even even if like even if this pleasure principle was not, you know, 100% of, of why we do things, but was only, let's say, 5%, even it being 5% of the um, agents or factors behind what we do things, that would be enough to prevent a free will. In other words, because, like, if, if you're basing a decision and 5% of it is absolutely necessarily a product or a result of something that's not in your control, like this pleasure principle, that means the entire decision is not in your control. In other words, like, let's say I'm, I'm lifting this table in front of me, right? Okay, and I can lift it, you know, 95%, right? But I would need, you know, someone else to help lift the other 5%, otherwise it wouldn't go up, okay? If that's the case, I can't say that I can, you know, that if I lift the table you know, if the table goes up, that I will have, you know, lifted it completely on my own. Because I haven't, you know, that 5% that, that is absolutely necessary. So, you know, apply that analogy to our human will, and you understand that even, even if, like, this pleasure principle was just 5% of the motivating factors behind our any decision, that would be enough to refute free will, to make it impossible. Okay. I, <laughs> an irony... A, a, a sublime, powerful irony here. It's like, okay, um, a lot of people don't get this. I mean, like, the logic refuting free will couldn't be stronger, couldn't be more simple. Everything has a cause. Free will is impossible. End of story. Okay, that's how simple it is. Yet, like, people don't get this. As ostensibly intelligent people, people with PhDs, People on the Supreme Court, a lot of people who should be smarter, you can't blame them because they're on free will, don't get this. And why don't they get this? It's because of this pleasure principle. In other words, you can't blame people for not getting that free will is an illusion. Okay? Why? Because, like, basically, in their minds, you know, I did the last show was about this. They like believing that, that they have a free will. It gives them pleasure to believe they have a free will. So in other words, like, it's because of this pleasure principle that fate, reality, the causal past, doesn't allow them to understand this. Okay, that's how, that's how powerful this pleasure principle is. And that's, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge irony, you know. It's like, you know, so, so what's, the, um, what's the answer to this? One is that, like, to the extent that, like, all right, a lot of people 
this is again this is a very new revolution it's really like you know taken full force as of 2010 you know before that there was very little published especially in, in major magazines um, 2010 and and you know this show you know my work is a part of this in, in, in April 2010 I created this meetup in Manhattan that created a buzz about it you know like millions millions of times people would see the um, the website listing on the meetup.com site and that would get them thinking that would get them talking and then this show premiered like January 6 2011 so by April 2011 you had the first ever magazine science magazine new scientist based in Britain having not just a story refuting free will a cover story you know their cover story was like you know why free will is an illusion then um, then Sam Harris a three times best-selling New York Times author um, in March of 2012 published you know a very popular book titled free will that refutes free will a few months after that um, scientific American mind publishes its own cover story first ever refuting free will so again this like these last several years have, have been a historic kind of a um, shift uh, it's an awakening a revolutionary awakening to what what um, what our human wills are about and so what happens like as people begin to, to think about this more and understand this more they're gonna understand that like they can have as much pleasure or more by understanding that free will is an illusion than by holding on to the belief it's kinda like you know it might have in the past some people might have felt really good about believing the world was flat you know to believe that it was an orb that was a horrible belief for them how could you like feel happy about it, the world being an orb where people on the bottom will fall off and out? doesn't make sense like you know people need things to make sense so as as people understand the free will is an illusion they'll feel happy about it and that happiness will allow them to understand it okay this is George Ortega thanks for watching I'll be back with this more again soon thanks